Ah, you've returned, my beautiful acolytes. In our last tale of dread, we built, pre-weathered, and primed a sinister cavalcade of chaos cultists to send into the cursed city of Mordheim. For tonight's offering, we will take these ghoulish grayscale fiends into the acrylic gauntlet, so as not to extend the pleasantries further. Ready your souls and recite the holy incantations of creativity as we paint our Cult of the Possessed Warband for their arrival into the City of the Damned. Klaatu! Marada! <laughs> Now, as you know, this series took longer to finish than the combined runtime of the Friday the 13th filmography. This was in part for two reasons. The first being my personal life got a little crazy, something that I'm sure my internet audience doesn't give a shit about. However, the second hurdle is a bit more interesting. As I began the process, I quickly ran into a massive learning curve, an affliction I call the... That's a good question, what do I call it? Let's go with the big dudes in power armor problem. Now, space marines are simply put, amazing. The 40k lore behind them is the stuff of legend, they're fun to paint, and they come in two distinct flavors, loyalist and badass. Even the most ardent of Games Workshop's critics think that these hulking titans of war are awesome, and if they tell you otherwise, they're lying. Being a Chadley Warhammer Fantasy Battles Chaos player and a massive Black Templar fan, most of my hobby career has been spent painting dudes in armor. Armor, to the point of exclusivity. And therein lies the problem. Now the painting process for heavily armored warriors is pretty straightforward. You do your base coats, drown the miniatures in oils and enamels, a removal pass with a q-tip, add highlights and effects, and model done. When faced with my Mordheimers, I had to contend with the fact that my warband had an equal distribution of armor, leather, exposed flesh, and cloth. I couldn't just do the standard grim dark reductive technique on the miniature as a whole, but rather, I had to address each part individually as I went along. While I was able to figure out an approach that worked, it gave me pause and made the process go much slower than intended. This process was challenging, yes, but I feel like it helped me elevate my skill as a miniature painter. It forced me outside my comfort zone and got me to think about the painting process differently. So to you, humble viewer and dearest subscriber, I extend this quest, a feat of arms, if you will. Between now and next Halloween, I challenge you to paint something that isn't a walking suit of armor. Let's build up our skill together. Comment below with what miniature project you are going to paint. Got it? Good. And now, without further ado, let's begin. As a refresher, in my previous video, I showed a couple of examples from artist Mike Francina that would act as a color guide for my warband. I wanted my ne'er-do-wells in yellow robes with purpley, sickly flesh. And well, would you look at that, yellow and purple are complementary colors. Little bit of color theory to start things off. This was also the first project that I got to use this amazing new brush set. I kick things off with some pre-shading using an extremely watered down mix of Druki Violet, which I applied in the deepest recesses of the robes, slowly building up the pigment. I then came in with some Caribou Crimson to act as a blending color between the purple wash and the white zenithal highlight. In theory, this work was supposed to add some color variation to the contrast paint to follow. However, when I later added the enamel washes and weathering effects, these opening moves got buried and weren't really noticeable in the final product. So for those following at home, you could probably skip this step. I don't have a lot of experience with this particular pre-shading technique, so I'm going to have to practice this method further, likely using a heavier application of washes. Remember here at the channel, we document everything, including the failures. Next, I hit all the robes with a watered down pass of my favorite contrast paint, Nasdrag Yellow. I often see people online lamenting about painting anything yellow. This is strange to me because when you combine this stuff with a white zenithal highlight, you get a brilliant result. So why does painting yellow get such a bad rap? <laughs> Honestly, I have no idea. I suspect a lot of new hobbyists are trying to build up a layer of bright opaque yellow over a base coat of black. That can be a difficult task, hence why I'm approaching the color using a bright zenithal highlight over my black base coat in conjunction with the yellow contrast paint. So whether you're painting Imperial Fists, Bad Moon Orcs, or sadistic Mordheim cultists, this Nasdrag yellow contrast paint is going to be your best friend. In total, I did two to three passes of my watered down Nasdrag yellow mix until I achieved the rich mustard yellow effect I was going for. Now, as a general note, I feel that using bright and quote unquote happy colors with factions considered to be bad guys adds something interesting. 
Apart from the intense visual, the bright colors on bad guys add an unsettling sinister element. There's a feeling of wrongness and an element of deception, as if to suggest, how could you fear something that is dressed in a color that is typically associated with happiness and well-being? It reminds me of this quote. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. I feel that a common tactic among villains in a grim dark setting, however seemingly innocent or vile, would implore this form of visual deception to ensnare their chosen targets. Now, on the flip side of this, I typically put my good guys in black, or at the very least dour muted earth tones. To me, this subtly implies that they are Puritans that reject the corrupting touch of pleasure and ecstasy, knowing full well of the descent into decadence and degeneracy to follow, ending ultimately with the damnation of the soul. Bit of a tangent, I know, but I felt like sharing some of my own personal theories of color choice might be of interest. Hopefully you're inspired to explore some interesting artistic choices with your own minis. To finish off our flamboyant fanatics, I came in with a light stippling dry brush pass of Army Painter's Demonic Yellow. This was to act as a general mid-tone to help blend some of the shadows and blotchy parts left over from the contrast paint. From here, I finished off the models with an extremely light dry brushing of a one-to-one -one mix of Demonic Yellow and Moon Dust from Army Painter. With this pass, you want to focus on the uppermost edges of the robes or any parts of the model that would receive the most light. Remember, work extremely light and with a soft touch. Do not overdo it. At this point, your robes are done, minus any application of enamels or weathering products, which we will get to later. Next, we move on to the leather. Because I am a generous host, I will be demonstrating two different leather recipes for all the gloves, pouches, masks, jerkins, boots, and what have you. Both recipes are incredibly simple that utilize a heavy washing technique that when fully dry, yield a great result. What you will first want to do is come in with your whitest white paint and go over all the leather bits that suffered collateral overspillage from all the yellow paint that got hammered into the robes and cloaks. Don't worry if the reapplication of white paint wrecks any zenithal highlight on the leather parts. It won't be noticeable and it won't matter. Starting with Seraphim Sepia by Citadel, you will want to do two heavy wash passes, applying the paint straight out of the pot and directly onto the miniature, massaging a majority of the pigment into the recesses of whatever you're painting. Be sure to wait about 15 minutes between each pass, allowing the pigment to fully cure and adhere to the miniature before the second application. Otherwise, you run the risk of removing the layer of paint below from the first application, which would look wonky. To create a nice warm tone in our leather, you will want to come in with a pass of whatever flesh wash you have on hand. In my case, Reichlin Flesh Shade by Citadel. The key is to use a wash with a nice reddish hue. Like the previous step, you will want to do a medium to heavy wash of the surface area, working with the paint straight from the pot using no thinner. However, unlike the previous step, I only did a single pass of Reichland Flesh Shade. I didn't want the reddish flesh tone to overpower the established sepia wash below. My objective was only to shift the hue of the sepia tone to a warmer value. Lastly, you are going to do a single medium to heavy wash pass using Agrix Earthshade from Citadel, or whatever dark brown wash you have in your arsenal. The aim is to darken down the previous washes, push the contrast of the shadow regions of the leather, and unify the leather bits with a nice deep earthy filter. Once dry, you are in the clear and ready to move on. Simple as. <laughs> Easy peasy lemon squeezy! To create a visual difference between the leather pouches and leather under armor on some of the miniatures, I created a recipe using the same techniques as previously demonstrated, but with a darker set of paints that yield a faintly semi-gloss finish. As with the previous technique, you will want to avoid thinning any of these washes as it will only prolong the process. Starting with Army Painter's Strong Tone, I did two heavy wash passes allowing for plenty of dry time between each pass. Next, I jumped back to Seraphim Sipia and did two medium to heavy washes, as in the step prior. I then came back with my good old buddy Agrix Earthshade with a unifying heavy wash. And lastly, I hit the leather with a heavy wash of Army Painter's Dark Tone. Now, if you are going for an extremely dark leather hide, then follow this up with a second pass of the Dark Tone or Agrix Earthshade. Dealer's choice. Now, as a side note, personally speaking, unless you're going for a Golden Demon Award, you don't need to overcomplicate painting the leather materials. Sure, you could add scratches and such to the paint job, but for something that looks convincing and is realistic enough, this multi-wash method is far better than anything else I've tried. Hell, I would totally enter these guys in a warband painting competition without fear of how the leather looks. Would this be considered cutting corners? Eh, I don't know. I would just think of it as freeing up time for other details that matter more in the overall grand scheme of things. 
Fest. So where are we now? After the close of Wash Fest 2023, I quickly popped in the rest of the base coats, leaving me with these results. For the metallic armor, I did a simple mix of two parts Army Painter's gunmetal to one part Vallejo's black metal. The rest of the weapons and chainmail got a base coat of strictly gunmetal. The sickly skin of these aquatic devils was made up of one part of Army Painter's alien purple to two parts of Army Painter's mummy robes. I then went in with a heavily thinned down wash of Druki Violet by Citadel, something in the ballpark of like five parts water to one part pigment. The red leather straps and cloth was achieved by using using Citadel's Flesh Tears Red Contrast Paint, straight from the pot. For all the bones, talons, beaks, and claws, all I needed was Army Painter's Mummy Robes. For any hair that was on the models, not that there was much to begin with, I did a healthy coat of the Silicon Gray Contrast Paint from Citadel. Now initially I wasn't going to go over this next part, but screw it, let's beef up those watch hours, shall we? For the wooden part of this Beastie Boy's shield, I started with an application of Leather Brown by Army Painter. Towards the lower third of the shield, I glazed on some Oak Brown by Army Painter, in keeping with the shadows that were present in the original Zenithal highlight. To add some warmth to the wood, I applied a wash of Gilman Flesh Contrast Paint by Citadel, using my wet palette to thin down the pigment. I made sure to drag the pigment so that most of it was deposited in the shadow region of the shield. Finally, I did a light to medium wash using Agrix Earthshade, completing the shield. Well, now that no stone has been left unturned, I'd say it's time to dial things up a notch, starting with the armor. Initially, I envisioned the steel plate of these deranged weirdos to look a bit different. However, as I began work on the first set of minis, I stumbled across an incredible recipe that is easy to achieve and looks great if you're going for a colder, darker armor tone. Like with the leather recipes, I achieved this result using a series of washes of a light to medium pigment consistency, allowing for plenty of dry time between applications. With the base coat already in place, I began with Drakenoff Nightshade, which I thinned down with water from my wet palette. Avoiding any trim on the armor, I made sure that the armor panels got a thin wash, pulling the pigment into any recesses, crevices, or where the trim meets the armor plating. The Dragon of Nightshade introduces a cold tone to the armor and shadow values, while separating the detail from the trim and the armor plating, thus creating a better clarity of detail on the miniature. Next, I did the same thing with Collier Green Shade, this time focusing on the mid-tones of the armor. I started the wash on the areas of armor that would receive partial light, then proceeded to drag the pigment into the deepest recesses of the details. This helped create a nice gradient of detail by blending the brighter parts of the metal with that of the Dragonoff Nightshade in the shadows. Next, to introduce some grime and aging to the metal, I came in with Agrix Earthshade. Using a medium amount of pigment loaded on my brush, I stippled the wash on any of the weapons, armor, or anything silver that I felt needed to look worn or tarnished. Remember, in Mordheim, none of these guys have access to any good gear, and because of lack of supplies, greed from warband commanders, and the madhouse that is the city itself, I doubt any one of these guys is focused on maintaining their gear to any level of acceptability. Most of these lunatics just need something reliable enough to get the job done. Getting back to the painting process, the final wash was done by Nuln Oil, thinned down using my wet palette. Unlike the previous steps, most of the armor, depending on the miniature, got an all-over general wash. My main focus being was to make sure that the pigments settled into any of the shadow regions or any of the recesses of the armor details. Please note that I'm using the old Nuln Oil paint and not the new updated mix that Games Cringe Shop stupidly changed. Man, talk about taking an L. Because of this unfortunate change to an old fan favorite, I will be looking into alternative black washes from Army Painter's Dark Tone to the new upcoming Villainy Ink Enamels, or possibly a reliable oil wash from my Aptalon 502 oil paints. It's a damn shame, really. The old Nuln Oil recipe was near perfect, and it helped me achieve such great results on this project. Speaking on the finished product, I think the bluish hues on the metallics look amazing in contrast to the warmer tones of the cloth and leather. Thinking on this armor recipe further, I certainly want to revisit it on another project I have brewing in the background. Oh, so many tantalizing possibilities. Anyway, time to focus as we're nearing the home stretch. With the armor more or less done, it's time to get out the enamel washes. For all the yellow robes and cloth, I used AK Interactive's Winter Streaking Grime. The Winter Streaking Grime has a nice swampy, sickly, dark green hue, which makes the bright yellow robes look oh so grody. After I applied this to the entire warband, I came back with the 
conductive technique using a Q-tip and mineral spirits in a dabbing motion on all the parts that received an enamel wash. This removed that excess winter streaking grime, leaving me with that I've been traveling through the swamp and rain look I was going for. I followed this up with dark brown wash by AK Interactive using the same technique focusing on the armor parts of the warband. An important note, dear viewer. During the process, avoid getting any of the enamels on the skin of the miniature. You do not want to shift the hue of the fleshy parts away from that eldritch purple tone we're trying to establish. Now, this isn't totally avoidable. The grim dark reductive technique is a bit on the messy side of the spectrum. So if there's some collateral overspillage, it's not the end of the world. Just exercise caution and don't get carried away. Now, as you can see, my enamels are of older bottles and tend to dry very dusty and matte looking. This is a cool effect, but one that I'll be altering towards the end of the painting process. But first, the flesh of the miniature is going to undergo some cosmetic surgery. <laughs> Over the course of a project, there could be a lot of adjustment, repetition of steps, and sometimes going back and reworking specific parts. Bringing our gray plastic to life takes a great deal of love, attention, and care. When it comes to painting skin, my mantra is always the same. Adjust, adjust, adjust. Admittedly, this next bit may give you a little bit of deja vu. Again, again, again. Just bear with me, my humble hobby heretics. For as some of my fellow Inquisitors say, the ends justify the means. On your feet, maggot! 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 I'm trying to be nice to you, maggot! Now move! So first things first, I hauled out the Druki Violet again and applied the wash to all the skin on the miniature, thinning it down using my wet palette. I felt that the prior wash wasn't sufficient enough to denote the recesses of the skin with a nice deep purple. Coming back with an all-over general wash also helps you visually pick out where you want to place your highlights, mid tones and other details to follow. Admittedly, I could have done this sooner, but I wanted to proceed with caution on the skin until I actually got to detailing it. Next, I came back with a two to one mix of mummy robes to alien purple from Army Painter. However, this time the mix was heavily thinned down with water to an almost glaze-like consistency. I cannot stress this importance enough. The semi-opaque nature of this mix allows you to bring back the brightest highlights and overall brightness of the skin while keeping a hint of that drooky violet tone beneath. In terms of the brush technique, you're going to want to do a lot of glazing, but also some light stippling to add some random modeling to the skin. There will be a lot of this in the subsequent steps to follow. To introduce a middle color value between the Druki Violet and the Mummy Robes Alien Purple mix, I came in with one part Barbarian Flesh, one part Alien Purple, and two parts Mummy Robes mix, heavily thinned down to that glaze consistency I talked about. I used this knot wash to not only tie in the lightest and darkest parts of the flesh, but also to bring in a warmer tone to the skin as well, so our models looked somewhat human adjacent. This was also specifically added to the areas of skin that would theoretically receive partial light on our zenithal highlight spectrum. To push the warmer tones further, I came in with an extremely thin glaze of Barbarian Flesh. Again, this was a very subtle and very controlled application, boosting the warmth of the flesh in only very deliberate areas of the miniature. <laughs> now for the fun part. Using Kerberg Crimson, thinned down with some water, I stippled on some speckles to the skin and freehanded a bunch of squiggly lines to mimic veins. You only want these features to be semi-transparent, so if you're following along at home and you go too dark on this modeling step, fear not. We will be glazing over these dots and lines to blend them into the skin so they appear just beneath the surface. You could also use the Kerberg Crimson to add redness or depth to the recesses of the flesh. I don't know, maybe these guys have horrendous skin allergies. <sighs> a penny for every time that's happened. <laughs> Following this step, we will come in with a heavy watered-down glaze of Gilliman Flesh by Citadel. This serves a couple of purposes. It helps smooth over the previous two steps, adds further warmth to the skin, and blends the brightest highlights and the darkest purples together. Additionally, off-camera, I came back with some of that original Mummy Robes Alien Purple Glaze to pop some of the highlights and clean up some of the Kerberg Crimson veins that looked a little too stark. Having overly complicated my life with the skin recipe, I didn't want to stress over the eyes, so I decided they would look more horrifying as just deep, glossy pools of blackness. Lifeless eyes. Black eyes, like a doll's eye. When he comes at you, doesn't seem to be living until he bites you. What I did was I painted them using Abaddon Black and added a few applications of Army Painter's Dark Tone and some brush on gloss varnish. Voila, instant creepy alien eyes. Remember, sometimes when you stare into the abyss, 
the abyss stares back. I'll never put on a life jacket again. At this point, I locked in everything with a brush on gloss varnish. This also brought back some of the richness of color to the enamels I used prior. I then added some brush on matte varnish to the miniature, only leaving the gloss varnish on parts of the skin that would have sweat or on parts of the garments that would be wet from personal use or the surrounding environment. The way I see it, varnish shouldn't be used as the last step of miniature painting, but as a means of creating surface variation prior to readdressing the highlights or adding effects. Finishing the model with an all-over pass of varnish can ruin the natural properties of your paints, so think of it as an effect, if anything. Plus, if you handle your miniatures by the base, like a sane person would, you shouldn't need to worry about your paint being rubbed or scraped off. Moving forward, I'm only going to be using the varnish as an effects paint for surface variation, further relying on the natural matte, satin, or gloss properties of whatever paints or products I'm working with. This will be covered in future releases. Alas, our dark journey into the Maw of Madness is quickly coming to a close. For this final chapter, I will be adding broken highlights to the armor and metal surfaces, applying various washes to age parts of the mini, and redressing certain details where needed. I, of course, will be using a variety of weathering products, such as Dirty Down Rust for the battered armor, and Dirty Down Moss for the parts of the robes that would be dragged across the ground on the Colt's journey to Mordheim. As always, once finished, I will use everyone's favorite blood effects paint, Blood for the Blood God by Citadel. In summary, wrapping up with all the last little details that help bring that added bit of life and gritty realism to our models. While I will show this process in the background, I will lay out the in-universe lore of my Cult of the Possessed Warband so that we may fully immerse ourselves within the diabolical world these deviants inhabit. Now, as mentioned in my previous video, the Chaos Cults are drawn to the City of the Dam by the presence of the Shadow Lord. Now, as many astute members of my audience pointed out in the comments of my last video, the Shadow Lord is the Chaos Demon Bellicor. I was going to mention this in the original script, however, as I dove deeper into my research into the original rulebook and surrounding town prior publications, I felt the character of Bellicor was a bit of a tack-on to the Mordheim setting, as if Games Workshop had added him as a bit of an afterthought, which to me felt like it was outside the original spirit of the game. I mean, Bellicor isn't even named in the original rulebook or the surrounding town crier publications. Naturally, it seemed in my mind that the identity of the Shadow Lord was never meant to be known. So, while I debated this point in the comments, I decided to reach out to some of my contacts who were close to the original creators of the game. They told me that indeed, Bellicor was meant to be the Shadow Lord. So to my band of chaos, enthusiasts in the comments, I say Kings to you for not. You were right, you beautiful heathens, you. However, I do maintain that the best way to go about creating your own Cult of the Possessed Warband is to do so from the perspective of the cult itself, who does not know the true identity of the Shadow Lord. The Daemon Bellicor is a Chaos Undivided Being who specializes in deception and subterfuge, so you don't need to worry about being creatively boxed into a particular look or theme. The Lord of Shadows takes many forms, along with his begotten followers, but keep in mind some degree of role-playing should be part of the creative process. That said, when coming up with the look and aesthetic of my warband, I wanted to define the relationship to the mysterious Shadow Lord and figure out how the cult views their enigmatic master. So let's put on some spooky music and see if we can't immerse ourselves into some role-playing and world-building. For my cultists, they see the Shadow Lord as the key to the metamorphosis of the flesh and an elevation to the higher planes of existence. He isn't seen as a malevolent creature of darkness, but a guide to the further reaches of existence that hide behind the veil of reality. He speaks from the shadows, only revealing himself to those who wish to consecrate their ascendancy to the realms beyond the mortal plane. They call this journey the Golden Path, or Amber Waltz, a series of signs, portents, trials, and rituals that these fanatics must undertake to breach the boundaries of our reality and those that lay beyond. For those in the cult, they are often gifted with mutations that have characteristics of seabirds of prey or creatures from the oceanic depths. Indeed, they are even joined by warp entities that exhibit these characteristics as well, which the cult themselves see as aspects of the Shadow Lord, or Amber King, as they have named him, calling them home to Mordheim. Well, 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 I hope this little snippet of my Warband's backstory has served as a nice little bit of inspiration for your own creations. If there's interest, maybe I could do a lore video that expands on the history of my Warband. Let me know in the comments. Until then, let's see the finished Cult of the Possessed Warband in all of its diabolical splendor.
journey back to Mordheim is complete. I hope this sequel to part one was just the thing that you needed to get you excited for your own journey back to the Cursed City. The Cult of the Possessed series isn't quite over yet, as there may be a freehand and basing guide tutorial in the future. However, to keep things fresh, I will be setting my sights on a certain group of secretive warriors, this time from the war-torn battlefields of the Dark Millennium. As always, before I go, I want to give a massive shout out to all my lovely Patreon and Subscribestar supporters. At the recruit level, Jason Guy, and at the disciple level, Argyris, Militant Mama, The Rascal, and Hardtix Heretics. You are all absolute chads, and I am just humbled by your generosity. Seriously, you guys are amazing. I'm also trying to figure out how to consistently crank out more videos while not compromising on quality. With the madness of the 2023 holidays behind me, my goal is to reorganize my workflow so that I may provide you with more content for you all to sink your teeth into in 2024. I am certainly looking forward to unleashing my next wave of hobby heresy upon thee. Until then, and as always, Godspeed on your journey into the Grim Dark.